relationship with him, to receive salvation. But there comes a time that uh, the work is done. That we labor during the day. When the evening comes, we don't labor anymore. The evening of the life of us human beings is in the glorious and second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. On that day, which would be a day on the calendar, a certain year, a certain day of the month, a certain time if you want, wish, that the Lord will appear in glory with all his angels. The sign of the cross will appear in the heavens. In this age, this world as we know it, human history will come to an end. This is the teaching that is given to us by our Savior himself. This is the teaching that we adhere to, that we proclaim in doctrine. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. We say that in the creed every day in our daily prayers. And look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We say that part of the creed every day again in our prayers. When we gather in the church, the icon of the ascension that's above us, we see our Lord ascended in glory. But as he ascended in glory, he said, the angel said, to the apostles, the way you saw him go up, the same way he will come again. The icon of the ascension, it wasn't only the 40th day after Christ's resurrection from the dead, this prophetic icon, it speaks to us again that Christ comes in glory. And as the apostles stood there looking up to the heavens, wishing for the master to come back again, we stand in the church, having that icon above us, in front of us, so that we can contemplate that our Lord will come again in glory. The second and glorious coming he speaks of. If we were to write an essay on the second coming of Christ, what could we write? What would we say? Most of us would probably be fearful. We don't want to even think of that day, let alone realize that it's coming to pass. We would think that there's plenty of time for us to change our ways. I have many years before me. At the end of the world, it's not coming in my time. The Lord says, we don't know the day and the hour that the Son of Man will come unexpectedly. The people will be unprepared for his second coming. And so we're always told to be watchful, to be mindful of the end of things. Even when we leave the church, on the back wall of the church, the iconography that's there is always about the last things about the resurrection of the dead, about the river of fire, about the judgment, the tribunal of the eternal kingdom of heaven that we see depicted there on the back walls. To remind us again, when we're in church, we look here, we look to Christ coming in glory. We look to the east, we think of that, the glory and from on high our Lord. And then even when we leave, the last thing on our mind is to look at the images again. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. The coming of Christ is called the fearful second coming. When we look at all the images that are given in the gospel, it's frightening. The river of fire, the unceasing worm, the outer darkness, uh, the tribunal, the judgment seat, the scales of justice, the accountability, the book of life. Christ comes as the judge. He's the savior, yes, but he comes as the judge. When we think of a judge, we're scared. We don't know how the judge is going to go. When we think that God will be angry on that day, the angry God, the God will reconcile all the things and make clear. The judgment is taking place every day. The judgment that is taking place every day is a judgment that we make upon ourselves. But let's go to the first of the four parts of eschatology, and that's again the second and glorious coming of Christ. We anticipate that day. We want that day to come. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus Christ, come. The last words of the New Testament. We want our Lord to come again. We want this world to end as we know it. This world which has fallen, this world which is, you know what the world is. It speaks for itself. We want the kingdom of God to come. We say that. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It's not just words, it's just not doctrine. It's something that we yearn for, something that we want. We're already citizens of this kingdom. We want to enter it more fully. And so it's coming. And in all the church service, 
Genesis, there's always a mention of the glorious coming of Christ and the judgment that's to take place to remind us, to remind us that our life is not here, that eternal life is in the kingdom to come, in the age to come, in which is neither sickness, suffering, nor sorrow, but beatitude and joy, an abundance of life in Christ. That our Lord Jesus Christ now is in the heavens, preparing a place for us. He says that. I prepare a place for you so that where I am, you too may be. <coughs> the second coming of Christ. When Christ comes in glory, it says it will be the judgment of the living and the dead. The dead will arise. Everyone that's ever lived. Everyone. From all nations. From all ages. They'll be reconstituted. Their soul will, be re will come back to their bodies, even if their bodies have been annihilated, it doesn't matter. Body and soul will come about, will be the resurrection of the dead, of all people, of all nations. The trumpet sound, it says, the angels and the people rise with them. You see that in the icon there of Ezekiel, in the valley of the dry bones. Flesh is put upon the body again, we have that resurrection. But it says also of the church of the living and the dead. There will be people who do not die. We say human beings die. Yes, but those that are alive at the time of the second coming of Christ, they will not die. As Apostle Paul says in the epistle, in the twinkling of eye, their nature will be changed from corruptibility to incorruptibility. And after the resurrection of the dead, there's a judgment. The book of life is open with our names on it. The Lord knows each of us. And then we have to give accountability. The day of judgment is a day of accountability. It's a time of clarification. God doesn't really judge us. God is saying amen to the judgments that we've continually made in our lives. What our choices were. What our decisions were. Where our interest was in. If we were in alignment with the gospel of Christ, or we chose to be rebellious, independent, self-willed, disobedient. That's our choice. But we're accountable for that. And our God loves us so much that he wants the day of judgment to come so that there's clarity, there's clarification. So that we know if we are with the Lord or not with the Lord. And the Lord knows if we are with him or not with him. And so we have to give account for ourselves. But every day we're making certain judgments, and those judgments are being written in the book of life. When our Lord comes, he's going to see us. We can't say, well, I can't be there that day. I'd rather commit it. No, it doesn't happen, obviously. I'm not ready for it. Well, it's too late. It is what it is. Our Lord sees us. And on that day, he will give the final amen again to us. We're always saying amen to the Lord. Amen is, so it is, so let it be. On that day, our Lord will say the final amen to us. My friend, this is what you've chosen. This is how you lived. This is what you desire. This is where your heart is. So be it. So be it, my friend. Go with the goats. Did you know to say, you've chosen this. So be it. Enter the joy of your master. It's perfect clarification. For sure, for sure, for sure. None of us will escape that day of judgment. Our problem is, we don't think about it. We put it off. We said that we have much time to repent. That it's something that, who knows it's going to take place. And if it does take place, I have lots and lots of time. We don't know how much time we have. We could die very suddenly. But for sure, probably, we'll, we'll die unless we're those few that are alive on the day when Christ comes in glory. Which will probably die of fright. But again, there's an accountability. If the Lord doesn't come as the angry judge, he comes as the merciful, loving Savior and Redeemer. And he will see the light that grows within us. Light attracts light. If we are full of light of the attitude and the grace of God, 
It's like a magnet. We're attracted to the, to the source, to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But there are others that will not want anything to do, just like Satan. He knew what he would lose. He didn't care. He'd rather be in hell than serve God and repent. There will be those that want nothing to do with the Lord, even on the day of judgment. They will not be repenting. And others will wish that they did repent, but they didn't repent. And that's why it's called the fearful day of judgment. The fearful day of judgment. And then what will happen is the souls, the bodies of the righteous, that they'll ascend in glory. They'll be an ascension into heaven. And the others, they will not ascend. St. Gregory Paulus says, everyone has resurrection, but only the righteous have ascension to ascend in glory with Christ. And then there is the eternal kingdom of heaven and earth. There's no other territory. There's no other place. There's no other reality. It's either heaven or it's hell. It's Hades. Those that are in Hades, hell, these will be there those that deliberately disobeyed God, those who wanted nothing to do with God, those who made choices in their earthly life, those who were separated, who did not want the love of God in them. The love of God is still there for them. The love of God is on everyone for all eternity. Even those in hell, God still loves. But the sinner rejects that love. It's costed. Light illuminates, it warms, but light also is caustic, it burns. And the light of the truth of Christ, of his love for Christ, it can be rejected. We see it being rejected all the time. And so it says that hell is not locked, not from the outside, but from the inside. That those that will be in hell will be those that have chosen to be there. Frightful. Who, how, how could somebody want this? But human freedom, human, human choice is something that God always respects. For us, as we have this commemoration of what we call Judgment Sunday, we shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't be fearful. There are two kinds of fears that theologians tell us. We always hear that in the church, the fearful day of judgment, with faith and love and fear of God draw near. The first stage of fear, it's a fear that is infantile. It's a fear of punishment. It's a fear of hell. It's a fear of offending God. It's a fear of being caught in our sin, whatever it is. It's an infantile fear. But it's a natural stage in our life. But as we spiritually mature, that kind of fearfulness is turned to a second stage of fear. And that fear is grounded in love. It's not fearfulness of punishment. It's a fear of losing the blessings of the Lord. It's a fear of not being an inhabitant of the kingdom of heaven. This is the fear that would devour us as such. It's a blessed fear. But we need that first fear at first. Why? Because we're spiritually immature. When we say fear, it could be a good thing. And it's a good thing even in the first stage, if it motivates us to something higher. The fear that is the love of God. Salvation is really dependent upon us. The whole world, the sinners who didn't, who didn't know the Lord, those of different faiths, that's God's business. He'll take care of that. He'll make the judgment. The judgment, as the Apostle Paul says, is most likely upon the conscience, the natural law that's written in the heart of men. God will be mad and he'll make the judgment. Not everyone will be saved. Some people say that everyone eventually will be saved. There will be a universal salvation of everyone. God will punish for a little while. There's nothing in the scriptures about that. Others wrongly believe that it's our acts that save us, the good things, the works of mercy, charity. We could misread the parable today because the parable says, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was sick and you visited me. I was naked and clothed me. These are doing good things. We think that perhaps if we do these good things, that we merit the kingdom of God. That's not true. That those things are manifestation of our faith. And it's faith that saves us. And faith is a gift from God. Salvation is a gift from God. 
When we do those things, we don't do it to make brownie points with God. To say, hey, I've done this. Now you do your part. No, no, it's not that at all. But it's a manifestation that our faith is real, that it's living. And it's not only vertical, but it's also horizontal. That is love of God and the love of the neighbor, the two great commandments. It's a manifestation of that. And finally, there is the salvation of others, Protestants, not all Protestants, the good and many Protestants, Catholic tradition, if you will. Let's say, if God will save us, we're predestined to be saved. And those that are not predestined, then they will perish. You have nothing to do with it. Your faith, your merits, that if God shows you, he automatically will put you into his kingdom. So what you do in your life, it's really negligible. It really doesn't matter. But the grace of God, the irresistible grace of God, he will do something for you. All these false theological ideas have to evaporate. It's the love of God that is there. The love of God our Savior who came in the cave in Bethlehem is the same love, mercy, righteous judgment that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will have on the day of judgment. We talk about mercy, and we ask God to be merciful. We ask God to be just. We ask God, but all those things are all together. The mercy, the justice, the care, the righteous judgment of God, it's really all about the love of God. We give it different terms, but it's the love of God. The real question is not if God loves us. The question is, what is the love that we have for God? Simple answer, the Lord says, if you love me, you will do what? You'll keep my commandments. You'll keep my teachings. That's all we have to do. All we have to do is to follow our Lord Jesus Christ as his disciples. And then we can truly say, Mananatha, come Lord Jesus Christ, come. We want the Lord to come. We want perfect clarification. We don't want to be in this no man's land. We want the fullness of those mansions, the kingdom of God that our Lord will give to his good and faithful servants 